And thank you again, everybody, for uh, taking the time to join our webinar today. My name is Sam Thurstone. I'm on the, uh, the business development team here. Opposite screen of me is our chief marketing officer, Sean Lee. And uh, yeah, really excited to be having this conversation with you today, Sean. Um, just some insight for everybody on the call. We wanted to have a conversation around um, just Amazon fundamentals. So whether you're a brand, um, you know, who's been selling on the channel for years or whether it's something that you're a little um, more new to, we thought it would be helpful to um, just kind of go back to the basics as, you know, Prime Day is next week. The holiday season is obviously right around the corner and um, things will be busy. And so um, we just wanted to kind of walk through some of the, the high level fundamentals about how we think about Amazon and how we've been um, able to take kind of unique approaches with the brands that we work with um, to help them succeed on the channel. Yeah, thanks, Sam. And I think our for context, like this deck was originally created for a large CPG company that's a fortune top 100 company. And we've kind of distilled it down, but I think regardless of where you are in your journey, I mean, whether you're, you're doing it in-house um, or you're adding headcount to do it in-house, or maybe you work with a consultant today or a small agency partner, I think as brand leaders, knowing these fundamentals kind of equips you to ask the right questions um, and make sure that either your direct reports or team or your partners are kind of all aligned to the right strategy and doing the right things to grow your business, um, especially in this critical Q4. Um, but if you've missed the boat for Q4 with some prime day and holiday coming up at a minimum, making sure that you course correct for 2021 by being equipped with this knowledge. Awesome. So just a quick uh, rundown of what our conversation is going to look like today. Um, we'll hit on introductions real quick and then um, just a quick background on who Amify is as a company. And then Sean's going to kind of walk us through, um, you know, why Amazon matters today, why it's more important in our opinion than ever before and why brands really need to be thinking about it um, as a mi mission critical, you know, revenue stream for the company. And then we're going to go through just kind of the three different go-to-market models that, um, you know, are available when it comes to Amazon. Sean's going to talk about the Amazon flywheel effect, what that is at a high level and what you can be doing as a brand um, to have a positive impact with the flywheel and start, um, you know, helping your brand rank higher and higher organically on the channel. And then Sean's going to kind of give us a, a glimpse into his, uh, you know, playbook, if you will, with regards to um, just con content and advertising and, and how he thinks about it. So awesome. Like I said, my name is Sam Thurstone. I've been with Amify for about a year now. I'm on the business development team working alongside Sean. Uh, my background is in sales. I previously uh, had experience in the supply chain space as well as um, working for a software as a service uh, market leader for a number of years and um, got tired more or less of the kind of the corporate structured um, multi-billion dollar business thing and wanted to move a little further downstream. So I joined Amify, like I said, about a year ago, um, helping build out the Cincinnati office and helping kind of redefine the go-to-market strategy. And then Sean, I'll let you do a quick intro on yourself. Yeah, perfect. I'm Sean Lee. I'm our chief marketing officer. So um, unlike Sam, I've always been on the, the brand side of things. So I spent about a decade at Procter & Gamble managing large brands like Imes and Old Spice, um, all the way to being in our ventures group and founding a brand called Zevo Insect that we took to market digitally first on Shopify and then kind of grew awareness and sold it into Home Depot and Target um, and scaled it kind of like you see a lot of the newer um, startup brands launch. And then left P&G and was the e-commerce VP reporting to the CEO of a private equity beauty company and helped build out their e-com department and presence. And then joined Amify with some fellow um, P&G colleagues and other great um, thought leaders in the digital space to really work with brands and kind of take our brand management knowledge paired with a lot of our performance marketing and agency knowledge and help brands holistically think about how to grow on Amazon and how that fits into their overall strategy. And I spend a lot of my time working with kind of director through C-suite and founder level um, folks of the, the clients that we partner with. So excited to be here and uh, chat with you guys today. Great. Good stuff. Uh, so 
I would be remiss not to give just kind of a quick spiel on who Amify is as a company since uh, they're the ones hosting the, the webinar today. Um, but what we are, what we do, why we exist is to help brands win on Amazon, right? So we position ourselves as being kind of that, that turnkey um, management partner for brands to help them from like an operational standpoint, um, management standpoint, strategy standpoint, win on Amazon. So all things Amazon related. Uh, we've been in business now for about a decade. We've had kind of a, a unique and interesting um, journey to getting to where we are as a company today, having started out as a reseller and being more so fo focused um, today as a like a services and strategy partner again helping brands with all things amazon related um just a few quick call outs that we like to mention um so like i said been in business for about a decade over that time we've done over 150 million in uh sales on amazon we've got warehousing capabilities as a company to help brands if it's a kind of a unique situation that they need help with that regard um something i always like to mention that i think is, is worth calling out we're the only full service provider out there that's got venture capital backing and why that matters why that's worth calling out is because that really sets separated us as a business um, from the rest of the pack in that it gave us resources to be able to really build out our capabilities, um, open up a second office, really go out and get the top talent. Like Sean had mentioned, um, a lot of, you know, former senior brand managers um, or like e-commerce executives from various organizations to help lead and build out uh, Amify's team. And then just a little badge of honor we like to wear. We've um, been on Inc. 500's fastest growing companies now for four years ago. And Great. So um, just to kind of give you some context into the brands that we typically work with, it's, you know, in all honesty, kind of all across the spectrum, right? So on one end, you've got maybe um, a smaller brand who's uh, more so in startup mode and has secured like VC funding and is wanting to, um, to launch on Amazon. And on the other end of the spectrum, you've got um, kind of more of the legacy brands, such as like Procter & Gamble, for example, we work with a number of their brands and then everything in between. So, um, you know, we've worked with hundreds of different brands in various categories that I think really uh, have, has given us a unique perspective into, you know, what it takes, what the nuances are for various categories with the brands that we work with. So that's, uh, that's a little thing on Amify and we'll get into the conversation now. So, um, Sean, for myself and for everybody on the call today, uh, kind of walk us through or like ground us in why Amazon matters even more in your opinion today. Like I get that it's big, I get that it's growing, I get that that needs to be um, probably a focal point, you know, for brands who are operating today, but kind of walk us through your thoughts on, on why you think, you know, there's even additional emphasis needed on Amazon today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I think this number has been pretty consistent that this data is from 2018, but it's been pretty consistent from 19 and 20. Amazon's almost half of all US e-commerce, which is absolutely crazy. Like, I mean, if you could get close, maybe brick and mortar is Walmart at like 20 to 25 percent of brick and mortar retail. Well, Amazon's half of market share of all US e-commerce. So it's much larger than all its next digital players. Um, much larger than a lot of independent D2C sites out there. I mean, it is just a behemoth of, of, of size. And I don't think we've really ever seen a company dominate that much of its space before. Um, and why that matters is that's where consumers go. That's where they're doing their research for ratings and reviews. So they could be in store and still pull up their phone and look at ratings and reviews. So Amazon, regardless of whether you sell, is on the path to purchase for a lot of consumers. They'll price check there, which can cause all kinds of issues. Um, but recently, like within the past few years, more consumers are searching on Amazon for products as they're starting their product discovery journey than Google, um, which is a huge thing that that's flipped and just shows the importance of Amazon and Amazon search, specifically Amazon advertising too. Um, the other astounding fact is almost 70% of US households now hold a Prime membership. So that's 120 million plus households that are ordering from Amazon three to five times a week and are expecting next day or two day shipping, which even just five or seven years ago, like people would be thrilled if their package got there before the two weeks it said it would. And now the majority of US households are so primed, no pun intended, to, to really 
get their product the next day. And that's what Amazon delivers to them really better than anybody else. Yeah, it's funny. I like thinking about it from like a consumer standpoint, I instantly go to like when I'm in Target, my wife's a huge Target fan and um, tends to go there a lot and uh, like walking the aisles and she's thinking about buying something. And like, I feel like I've been conditioned to immediately pull up my Amazon app and see like, you know, price compare to see if it's worth, you know, buying online as opposed to in, to, in the store. And to your point, like there's a better chance than not that I'm going to have it at my doorstep probably by the following day. So it's, I don't know, it's, it's just kind of funny how like that is, um, that is my, and probably the, the same mindset of like millions of other people today. Yeah, I agree. I think it's, it's a big trend And the other piece of importance and how competitive Amazon's gotten because of this stat. So 66% of all product searches are starting on Amazon now and people are using that in their, their kind of path to purchase funnel to discover brands. Brands have realized that and they're spending a lot more on Amazon as part of their marketing mix. So absolutely wild to me that in 2016, Amazon advertising and Amazon paid search, all those AMS services, were only bringing in about half a billion dollars of revenue per quarter. This isn't even adjusted for the latest data that I'm sure Amazon will release soon, but in Q4 of 2019, that's almost $5 billion during the higher holiday period that brands were spending on sponsored Amazon advertising products. So it's now kind of propelled itself behind Google, Facebook, Instagram to one of the top tier players in advertising. Um, and I think if you didn't have a strategy before, now's the time to start thinking about what's the role of that in your marketing mix, because gone are the days are just putting your, of putting your product on Amazon and kind of hoping that it sells. It's getting to be much, much more competitive, very similar to how paid search was on Google, probably 10, 12, 13 years ago, mm -hmm. but also a lot of opportunity for brands that are in the right categories that can capitalize on that. The other thing that's absolutely amazing is if you look at the pandemic, like our behavior as consumers and humans is fundamentally changed. Um, I think we're all living through it. We don't need to beat a dead horse on that, but e-commerce share was kind of chugging along at, at 1% growth a year and taking 1% share of overall U S retail sales. The first eight weeks of kind of the lockdown, that went from about 16% to 27%. And the, the data that we're seeing now is still hovering above 20%. So we really almost moved the needle about a decade in, in e-commerce and normalization behavior in a matter of weeks and months. And I think I, I was liking it back to my mom's probably the last person to adopt technology. And she started doing Kroger click lists or Kroger pickup. Um, which would have never happened had this not started. And she'll probably never set, step foot in a Kroger again. She absolutely loves it. It saves her a ton of time. So I think this kind of big shift changed the way that people behave. And now that they can order things on Amazon or from other websites or get their groceries put into their trunk, people aren't going to go back now that they've experienced and started kind of getting the habit of doing that eight, nine, 10, 11 times. Like it's going to be a long-term habit that forms. So mm -hmm recognizing that and making sure your business model's set up for that is, is critically important, not only for Q4, but as we look to 2021. Yep. Yep. That's awesome. Um, great. So Sean kind of shifting gears a little bit and focusing more so like on Amazon as a platform itself. Um, I get that there, you know, there's like, there's vendor central, there's seller central kind of walk us through, um, in your mind, like what the pros and cons are to the various like go-to-market models on Amazon. Yeah, absolutely. And I think starting there, we'll kind of take it to the basics of there's vendor central, which is all often referred to as one P and that's when you sell your products to Amazon Am Amazon owns the inventory and they resell them to the end customer classic retail or distributor model. Like you, they cut you a PO, you give them the products, then they sell them to the end customer. There's another model where you'll see companies like a pattern or a net rush um, where they'll be your reseller. So you sell your product to them and then they list them on Amazon on your behalf and kind of fulfill the demand that's out there and maybe invest a little bit, but oftentimes just fill, fulfilling demand. The other model um, that we see people do is selling direct to consumer via seller central or three P um, that's when you set up your own Amazon seller account and you sell directly to your customers oftentimes using Amazon to fulfill the product with something called fulfilled by Amazon. So you can participate in prime. Um, but those are really the three big models that have some advantages and disadvantages. 
So the first one, selling to Amazon or a distributor, big advantage is it's super easy. You just fulfill POs, right? Like they send in a big order, you ship it out on pallets and trucks and in cases, and then they do the rest, which is great for a lot of businesses. That's how a lot of businesses are set up. Um, yeah. Disadvantages, sometimes you can have lengthy payment terms, um, lower margins, depending on what they negotiate and damages and co-op and trade allowance, all those things. Um, and then you get less control over price and experience. Everyone's probably sold to Amazon and had them drop the price below Walmart, Target, a specialty retailer like REI. And then you have your, your buyer at those stores send you a nasty email or call you up saying, why is Amazon breaking the lowest minimum price? Like, we can't do that. Um, what's going on here? The other thing is, just like when you sell to normal retailers, you don't get the end customer data. Amazon owns that data or your reseller owns that data. So selling direct to consumer, on the flip side, there are some advantages. You can control your customer experience end to end, everything from price to the content that they see to how they experience it, um, who sells your products so that you can capitalize more on ads. Not always, but sometimes you can increase your revenue and margins because you're cutting out the middleman that you're giving resale to wholesale pricing to. Um, and then you get to own your customer data. So you get a lot of demographic data as well as first name, last name, and ship to address. While you can't remarket to those people, for kind of consumer nerds like me, it's great for modeling to understand like where are your consumers like living? Is there any overlap from your D2C website? What does that look like? Um, and we help brands do a lot of that. The downside is it's pretty intensive. You now have to run almost like you're running a separate D2C website, your own Amazon Seller Central account. You have to do your own forecasting, your own shipment plans. Um, sometimes you have to prep the product to be shipped into Amazon. And then you have to really manage everything from your content to your advertising and your pricing um, and stay on top of who's selling your product. So there's a lot of work that goes involved. So those are the, the big trade-offs in the model. Then there's some fulfillment options. So when you sell to Amazon, pretty straightforward. Most of the time, Amazon buys it. They ship it out to the end customer as part of Prime. Sometimes they do deals where there's direct fulfillment from your warehouse. Depends on your size. Likely not for most people on this call. Um, then there's Seller Central, which the three ways you can kind of do it is fulfilled by Amazon, which tends to be kind of cheaper and faster way to be participate in Prime. You send the product to Amazon. They pick, pack it, and send it out usually cheaper than fulfilled by merchant, which is where you do it yourself. You pay for FedEx, UPS, or USPS to ship it out. Maybe you pay for a 3PL, can be fairly costly. And then there's seller fulfilled prime, which they basically want you to do it all yourself, but you have to guarantee you're gonna ship it within two days. Um, so as we all know, UPS and FedEx two day shipping rates are very high. That tends to be price prohibitive for a lot of people. So we'll kind of breeze through this. If you wanted to see like brands that are on Amazon Vendor Central, here's kind of what you're gonna see on the product page. You're gonna see shipped from and sold by amazon.com. That kind of signals Amazon's buying the product and reselling it. You may have heard about the Amazon purge where they don't really wanna buy product from brands doing less than 10 million on the platform. They were planning to purge a lot of those lower brands from 1P over the past year. COVID happened and they've had a ton of other priorities trying to meet demand. So I think that's been put on pause. But I wouldn't be shocked going into 2021 if that's an initiative that gets picked back up because Amazon would much rather be a logistics provider in a warehouser that gets a commission than owning the inventory themselves. So they're really going to narrow their focus on the big companies of the world that they buy the products from going forward. Mm -hmm. um, and we talked about some of the pros and cons here. Um, I'd say the cons of Vendor Central is you're selling at wholesale pricing. You're paying additional fees to Amazon. Everybody feel like every year they renegotiate higher co-op freight and damage allowance fees. Amazon tends to squeeze vendors. Their algorithm sets the price and will cause channel conflicts and they can't change it because they say it's the algorithm. And then Amazon usually will recoup losses via chargebacks um, and can be complicated to reconcile. You don't always have full control over that customer experience. And then, um, Advertising really needs to be looked at as a percentage of your wholesale revenue versus percentage of retail pricing. And then there's limited access to consumer data, just like brick and mortar. When you're on the reseller model, this is when somebody buys the product from you and then resells it. What you tend to see is something like this, where it's sold by somebody like a net rush and then fulfilled by Amazon. Most resellers will use fulfilled by Amazon because it's efficient and cheap and a good way to go. The pros, it's super easy and simple. 
think the cons is you're still selling it at wholesale pricing. You don't own the consumer experience. And then we were a reseller for the first five to seven years of our life as a business. So we've learned that business in and out. You're operating on very, very slim margins after paying to list the product on Amazon. So oftentimes as a reseller, you're fulfilling existing demand and you don't have a lot left over to invest in content development or advertising for the brands that you're buying for. Um, just, it's just the math, like the margin isn't there. And multiple resellers, which is something that brands do, can lead to math issues where people are in a race to the bottom. And then consumers often blame the brand for a bad experience. They don't care who the reseller is. They'll just think, oh, I ordered this product. It showed up broken or damaged or was expired. I blame the brand, not I don't really care or know who the reseller is. And then there's limited access to data in that model as well. When you sell direct, here you would see, this is one of our brands that we work with, Hans de Fuko, fulfilled by Amazon. So they're selling direct, they own the inventory, they're selling on Seller Central. And we talked about some of the pros. You can treat Amazon like your own brand's website experience. Depending on you know, like the size and weight of your product, you can oftentimes increase your profit margins by removing the middleman. And then you get complete control over everything which can allow you to make sure your content's converting really good and that somebody else isn't benefiting from that. You can start to work to remove other people selling on your listings so that when you drive advertising there, you're the only one benefiting from it. And then you set your price at whatever makes sense so that you don't cause chaos with other channels. And then you get your own sales data for, for insights work um, and can really use that to better understand who your shopper is. The cons, it can be a lot of work. Oftentimes in this situation, people have to make a decision. Do you want to kind of buy a service provider or a partner to do it, or do you want to build it and hire somebody in-house? Um, both are good options depending on your size, but usually it takes someone to kind of manage and execute it, just like you would with your, your D2C website. Mm -hmm. Cool, super helpful. Thanks for walking us through that. Um, so you made a comment earlier, uh, kicking this off, you know, gone are the days where a brand can kind of just list their product on Amazon and it sells, which is accurate. Like that's true. We've, we're far, far, far away from, from that past state. Um, I think what a lot of brands don't understand, at least in the conversations that I have, or maybe they have like very minimal understanding about it is with regards to the flywheel and how that like plays into effect um, or impacts like the rankings and, and really overall brand performance. So can you kind of walk us through like, what is the flywheel? How does that work? And like, what impact does that have on um, like a brand's ability to rank, you know, higher and higher organically? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think whether you use the words like Google's algorithm or Facebook's algorithm or Amazon's flywheel, I feel like they feel like very confusing and kind of mystical and hard to, hard to understand. At the end of the day, if you think about Amazon's incentives, which are to sell more products and keep their customers happy, if you think about it through that lens, the elements that make up their flywheel really shouldn't come as a shock to many people. And I'll actually do this in reverse order um, here, but this is kind of the ranking factors that Amazon would put into their, their kind of what ranks and, and how you can rank organically and get the flywheel effect going. And the first piece, is inventory and fulfillment. So the product has to consistently be available. So you gotta be able to make sure you meet your POs when they, they order it, or you're, you gotta ship it in so that it's not out of stock when you're selling on Seller Central. They want you to have FBA, or if they buy it from you, they wanna make sure it's part of Prime because 120 million households have Prime. We know that that's a, a big driver of conversion and they'll prefer that over fulfilled by merchant. But at the end of the day, they really care about like sales and shopper behavior. So they wanna make sure for a given search term, somebody's clicking through to your product, it's getting a lot of page views. When they're there, they actually convert at or better than the category average. They don't wanna drive a bunch of people to a, a page that has a 1% conversion rate. They'd much rather drive it to your competitor who has an 11% conversion rate because it's all dollars and cents to Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and then search be behavior, how people get to your product. Then there's kind of the fundamentals to make sure your conversion rate and your products sell. You gotta do the basics around having a good title, bullet, descriptive bullet points, A plus content with brand registry, backend keywords for Amazon's search engine, having all your thumbnails and images with lifestyle images and benefit language, videos, brand posts, and using, usually if you participate in their beta programs, it can also help with some of these things too. The next thing is people wanna make sure that that second moment of truth 
when people get the product home is really good and that they actually enjoyed using your product. So Amazon's gonna put a lot of weight on review quantity. So how many reviews you have, star rating and seller rating. Like there's a ton of data that says going from over four star review to under, you can, your conversion rate can drop off 20%. So Amazon wants to make sure of the products people are buying that they're actually getting a good experience, which will likely mean that they'll repeat and come back. But just like a retailer, when you have a fixed amount of shelf space and the Amazon shelf is the digital shelf per search term, they really care about organic sales and the sales you're driving from ads, as well as any external factors you're driving there. Influencers, affiliate programs, Facebook ads that drive to Amazon. And they want to look at one metric that I think a lot of brick and mortar retailers do, and that's your units per, like units per day on a given search term. So think of that as like your, if you were selling to Kroger, it would be your units per store per day or units per store per week. And that's how they're going to assess you. Um, they also know that people try to game the system. So they'll look back at the past 180 days to make sure you're not just a blip or an anomaly. Um, and then finally, Amazon hates returns. It's a big cost for them. They want to make sure that your product doesn't have a high return rate as well or else they'll rank somebody a little bit better who has a, a lower return rate. So when you think through all those things, it's really just like fundamentals 101 of branding. You have to have, it's gotta be available and in stock, people actually wanna convert or buy your product better than the category average. It's gotta deliver a great second moment of truth or usage experience where they rate you high and come back. And then it's gotta move, the turns have to be there. And that's what Amazon really cares about at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So when you're launching a new product, I think the, the, where people get a little tripped up is I launched a, a brand new shampoo. Why am I not ranking on the term, the search term shampoo? And you're like, well, there's 30,000 brands that are trying to sell on that term and have been around for a long time and have a lot of sales rank. So really it's about like, what are the lower funnel terms that may be closer into what your product benefit is? Can you start buying advertising and then driving reviews and sales on those lower funnel terms? And then over time, you're going to start ranking higher, maybe on the top row or the second row of those, those terms organically. You'll start to flip from advertising sales to organic sales. And from there, you can start using those funds to reinvest into higher terms and start laddering up the flywheel. So it's really about being strategic about what you're going to focus on and what you're not and at what time. Um, I wouldn't launch a new shampoo brand and then go spend all my advertising budget on like shampoo or um, conditioner, like look for the terms that are kind of more core to what your product benefit or your niche or your consumer is looking for. Mm -hmm. And that could be an ingredient. It could be something that they're looking for that not everybody has and you have a right to win on. Yep. Got it. Makes sense. So before I want to get more into the advertising piece in a second, but like walk us through, um, your playbook, you know, for lack of a better term, when it comes to like content, like go a little further in, in that regard. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, um, and for those that may have joined other webinars, like this is what I tend to look for. It's like, does your product showcase brand benefit? Is it on brand equity? Does it catch attention? Is, does it use your recognizable assets? And is it very simple and clear? And I think the big things that the focus on, especially as we think about Gen Z and millennial consumers, who are used to like scrolling in feeds or TikTok, Instagram, or like swiping left to right on Tinder. In the context of the Amazon mobile app, these thumbnails are super important. It's no secret that, especially in America where we, we don't like to read, we'd much rather watch a video or see a, a visual. Um, so while these are important, I would argue that making sure your thumbnail images showcase your product, its benefits and features and have short little like benefit language, probably no more than four to seven words. That's going to be one of your most impactful things to drive conversion, then this copy. And then for people on the fence, the A plus content below the fold. So here you want to have five to seven images, a mix of lifestyle images and graphic overlays. For your bullet copy, you want to make sure that you have some sort of headline here, and then you can describe the rest. And it should be written for the consumer as well as with some of the keywords that you want to rank for. Amazon's kind of gotten away from like ranking you organically with keywords. They're much more focused on sales, but Google still indexes all Amazon pages. And oftentimes Amazon results are the number one or number two on Google. So writing these things, not only for Amazon, but for Google in mind too, is very important as you're doing research here. But really you just want to make sure people can take away the, the key benefit 
right out front. And if they want to read more, they can. I think going off that too, Sean, um, just in terms of like, like brand messaging, like you're talking about and brand voice, like it, it, at least to me, it's so clear if there's a brand that I like and that I purchase from on a regular basis and I understand, um, like their messaging and like the tone that they use. If I go to look at one of their products on Amazon and you can kind of like instantly tell if like the messaging or their voice doesn't align with like who the brand is and in my case, like it's been, I don't know, it makes me kind of like question who the seller is or, or prior to like fully understanding Amazon, like I would question who the seller was and maybe wouldn't purchase it at that point because it's like, this doesn't, this doesn't align with who that brand is. This doesn't seem like it, like it is the brand who's, who's saying all of this. And I think it can be a major turnoff. Yeah. I've done that, especially with like, if I'm buying like supplements or any, or vitamins or anything like that, if the, yes. if the copy is bad or whatever, I'm like, yeah, like, this may just be somebody like buying expired product or buying product from like a vitamin shop and then relisting it and marking it up. Like I almost don't trust that the brand's actually behind it when you see something that's done poorly. Especially when it's something that like you're consuming and you're putting on your body or anything. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I would say as far as thumbnails go, like here, this is a uh, client that we work with, but like a mix of like images and then having like your benefit language on here so that you can, people know what the benefit is, any iconography that you have, but not overdoing it. So you don't want it to look like a, a ton of word vomit. It's really the same thing that you would do for a, a floor stand in store or a banner at like your trade show or um, an end cap at a, a retailer. You want to make sure that kind of that in-store environment is like your digital in-store environment where you're using four to seven words and not getting too clunky. And then below the fold is super important. So A plus content. Um, this is really about making sure that if somebody wants to learn more about your product, they can dive into the features and benefits. They may even be able to, to do like a chart that compares across your lineup, maybe cross sells and upsells them. That's the one place that Amazon will allow you to link to other products in your portfolio. But we find like big conversion rate increases for brands that don't have A, a plus content that do. And then you can even get bigger gains if your A plus content isn't that great and you take it to, a, to the next level. Um, by kind of running this play, like even average content, by making it really good, you can sometimes increase your page conversion rates by 15 to 20%, um, which can be significant if you're selling hundreds of thousands of dollars of that product. I think we talked a little bit about the A plus stuff and then brand stores. I think this is really important too. Um, brand stores are important from an advertising standpoint, which I'll touch on a little bit. If you're doing sponsored brand ads, these tend to be great places to drive people where they can discover your products, almost like they would your website to understand the breadth and depth of your lineup. Um, this is where you're probably higher up in the funnel and you're going to use ads to drive people here to acquire new to brand customers. It's not somebody that knows the product that they want and they're just searching on Amazon and going to buy it. This is where you can really showcase your brand, your brand story and the, the lineup that you sell. And cool. kind of all that goes back into, as we talked about right now, brands are spending $5 billion a quarter in Amazon advertising, which is absolutely just crazy and it's insane. But if you're not, if you don't have good content to drive to, um, that's number one, you got to build the foundation of your house. And then with it being competitive, you really need to have an Amazon advertising plan to drive to your, your pages. So mm -hmm. at a high level, as you're talking to your agencies or your in-house team, um, these are really the three kind of different things. So ads are everywhere on the platform. Amazon's always working new ways to put ads in the platform. They can monetize it. They're making 5 billion a quarter. You're going to continue to see them pushing the limits on where they can place ads. And really there's, there's kind of three ones that we recommend being sufficient in first in that sponsored product ads, sponsored brand ads and sponsored display. Sponsored product ads are when you search a term like plant-based deodorant, they're usually the first row of, of where things show up. So this is somebody's looking very specifically for your brand or a category term. This is going to give you prime real estate, almost like it's an end cap in the store. And this is someone that's pretty far down the funnel. So these tend to be your most, your highest ROI and your most efficient um, in where they appear. They also show up on product pages. So a competitor, it could show up products related to this item. 
So you could try siphoning it away from a competitor as well. Sponsored brand ads are kind of this billboard real estate at the top here, where you can have your little logo of your brand, like some benefit copy of your brand linking to your brand store, and you can feature your top products. These tend to be a little bit mid funnel. So people are searching for a certain term, they see your brand, they're intrigued, they go to your brand store, and that's where you can start to showcase your lineup and use these really for new to brand customers. Um, but they're a little bit higher in the funnel. They also show up on competitor product pages too, in this brands related to this category in Amazon section. Then there's sponsored display ads. So these have been around as long as the internet. These are your banner ads. Um, and this is where you can target competitors' products or defend your own products. So Sarave here, another um, brand is targeting them. So they're buying real estate on their product page, trying to siphon people away. Um, so again, we kind of like to talk about it as defend, capture, and conquest in that order. First, you want to defend your brand from competitors so that they're not doing conquesting you. You want to capture new customers through the right category terms. Again, starting lower funnel and working your way up as you grow. And then you want to conquest some of your competitors where you have a right to win against them. So if I had to lay it out visually from a sufficiency standpoint, it's like defend with sponsored product ads and sponsored brand ads, start to capture new consumers with these ad units. And that's where you can start to use things like brand posts and their new video display or video ad unit. And then once you're kind of sufficient in these areas, look at what are your competitive set and who can you start to go after um, and then scale up there. And then when you're doing well there, you can start to look at off Amazon ads being with Amazon attribution. You can see if I send a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad or Snapchat ad to Amazon, I can know within a 12 day look back window if that ad actually converted into a purchase. So Amazon's letting you do that now. And we find it is a good tool in the toolkit to drive your Amazon sales um, and conversion rates tend to be pretty good. So once you're sufficient on Amazon, you can start looking at driving more of those off Amazon ads to, to really ramp and accelerate your business. So from an ad approach standpoint, here's an example of Defend. There's a brand, Master Appliance Heat Gun. And as you can see, it's a very specific brand name, but somebody else is conquesting this sponsored brand ad and sponsored product. Capture would be Heat Gun for Shrink Wrapping. So that same brand that was conquesting them is also dominating the sponsored brand ad and sponsored product ad here. And they're really going after kind of category words. And then conquesting for that brand we were just looking at, other people are targeting them with sponsored display ads. And then sponsored product ads are getting targeted down here with brands that are very similar to that. And then from a scale standpoint, Amazon's doing some really cool stuff now where they're testing sponsored video ads. So you can take up almost an entire row of Amazon real estate for about the same cost as a sponsored product ad um, with sponsored video. So it just gives you a great way to disrupt the feed and really capture people's attention and showcase your brand. And I know a lot of branders out there or, or brand leaders out there are already making a ton of great video for social media, for Instagram, for your website, for YouTube. This would be a great way to kind of repurpose that video or maybe trim it down a little bit for a way that works for Amazon. Great. great. So I, I know we covered a lot today, but wanted to cover the very basics for, for everybody on the line. We'll send the deck out. And if you have any questions, you can always reach out to myself or Sam. We'd be happy to talk to you about this. We love talking Amazon strategy. Um, but yeah, with that, um, we can open it up for any questions that you have. And it doesn't have to be only about this presentation. It can be anything Amazon and we'll try answer it unless it's a complete curveball. Um, there's a question about, can we revert back to the vendor central pros and cons? Yeah, I'm happy to drive back there and we'll send the deck out as well. Um, let me share my screen really quickly.
So vendor central pros and cons, um, here it is. If you want to take a screenshot of it or we can send it out as well. But what we had talked about is it's simple. Um, you get a PO, you negotiate with your vendor manager usually once a year, and then Amazon sends large POs. The cons are you're selling at wholesale pricing. Amazon usually makes you pay additional fees on top of that or trade dollars like their co-op fee, freight and damage allowance. They seem to want to squeeze people on that more and more each year. And then their algorithm will set the price once they own it. And there's nothing their, your vendor manager can really do about it. So oftentimes it can create conflict in other channels that you have to deal with or think through. Um, and then Amazon will try recoup losses if they lower the price where they're losing money through chargebacks. That can be complicated to reconcile or dispute. And then you don't always have full control over your own customer experience like pricing. And then I'd say from an advertising standpoint, you need to look at it as a percentage of the wholesale dollars or cost of goods sold dollars to Amazon that you're making, as opposed to if you're on Seller Central, you look at it more as a percentage of retail pricing and you may have a little bit more margin to reinvest back into advertising. Um, and then just like any other retailer, they're not giving you detailed consumer data or customer data for you to do any modeling or consumer research understanding with. And then Sean, I don't know if you see that, but there's a follow-up question kind of going off what you're saying, but how do you determine sufficiency of spend for each level? On advertising? Uh, it doesn't say, so that's my guess. My guess, yeah. So um, I think it really depends. I think first, there's, there's kind of a couple ways to look at it. It really goes back to what your objectives are. If you want to grow, if you want to maintain um, what it is, I would say oftentimes people get tripped up at only looking at like a cost is one of the terms that's always thrown out, which is your advertising cost of sale. And people are like, oh, lower a cost is very good. And oftentimes that will lead people to only buy their branded terms or defend their branded terms because the a cost looks really good. But you're not really doing a ton like acquiring new customers when you take a strat or an approach like that. Um, so as we look at sufficiency around that, I'd say it's defend so that you're, you're winning your probably like 70%, 80% of your share of voice for your specific brand terms. Um, when you move to capture, it really depends what your tolerance is. I tend to look at return on ad spend as opposed to ACOS when I'm looking at category terms. And it's what are the terms that I'm winning on? And if I have a a $5 ROI on a certain term, how much can I spend on that term until I start seeing a diminishing return? It goes down to $4, $3, et cetera. Um, so it really varies by brand and what your overall objectives are. But usually I would say, I oftentimes see people spend way too much on the defend, not enough on the capture, or they wanna move to conquesting before they they focus on, on capture. Um, every brand's unique and specific, but the other way I would look at it too is beyond just looking at how much your advertising drove in ad attributed sales, we also like to look at what were the organic sales for that same month because oftentimes you'll see that your overall sales lift as you're kind of winning with advertising and your organic sales will kind of be tracking that because you'll start ranking higher on certain terms. Um, usually if people dramatically pull back on advertising versus what they're doing, they'll see that show up in their organic sales at like a month or two lag time. So people will say, oh, I, I pull back on advertising. The next month, my sales were the same, but then three or four months down the line, they start to see a, a dip and they don't necessarily understand why. So we like to look at it in kind of totality and there's no like silver bullet of sufficiency. It's, it's really a, what's your tolerance and what does your return on ad spend need to be and how much can you keep spending um, before you start seeing diminishing returns on what that tolerance is. Helpful. Uh, Sean, we've got a number of questions coming in. Do you, do you see those or do you want me to just kind of read them uh, off to you? Read them to me. I, I can't see them for some reason. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about Amazon DSP? How is it best to use it? At what point in your defend capture conquest framework? Yeah. Um, Amazon DSP is, is kind of a little bit different or separate and it can be pretty expensive with like their minimum investments and I know they have like their broad display network. Um, I often find that it has from clients we've worked with that it has a lower return um, than being sufficient in kind of some of these things. So I would say 
if you're really good in defend, capture, conquest, and you're starting to scale, maybe that's the time to start looking into Amazon DSP, but sometimes their requirement, their minimum requirements of what you need to invest can be pretty high, anywhere from like 70 to a hundred thousand um, dollars. Oftentimes you might be able to get a better return driving um, like Instagram or um, Snapchat or Outbrain off Amazon ads to Amazon to convert before investing in, in DSP. I think DSP helps you get a ton of reach and awareness and if you're a brand like, like Tide or Olay that already has a ton of awareness and, and reach and you're available everywhere and you just need to like get more eyeballs on it and stay top of mind, Amazon DSP makes a ton of sense. If you're a million dollar brand, a $2 million brand on Amazon, still trying to scale and grow, it may not be the best place to spend your next dollar. Great. Um, okay. I currently have been supplying Amazon via Vendor Central for many years. In the last three years, I've hired a consultant to help with advertising and managing Vendor Central. He's pushing me to Seller Central. However, I understand that will shift a lot of work in-house. In your slide of pros and cons for Seller Central, you listed need an expert partner help. What kind of expert partner help will be needed? Is this something you help with? Yep, so this is something that we help with. Um, we kind of, there's kind of two ways that you can approach it. And yes, I would agree that if he's pushing the, you to do it, one, the first thing you should do is look at the margin. Like, is it going to make more sense for you to make that move? The other thing is plan out that move smartly because if Amazon has three months, four months worth of inventory of your product, if you move to seller central and stop fulfilling POs to Amazon, they're still going to have to sell through that inventory. So there may be a gap where you don't get a PO from Amazon um, until they sell through and you start ramping up selling direct. Um, so managing that transition is completely doable and we've helped a, lot, a ton of brands doing it, do it. You just have to be smart about it. And oftentimes it can be the right move for many brands. I'd say the biggest lift that we see is like setting up your account, making sure everything's like set up accurately, transferred over that you jump on the, the ASINs appropriately so that you can sell on them. And then a lot of the day-to-day -day work is like from a content and advertising standpoint, probably similar to what you're doing on vendor, but you now have to start looking at inventory and making sure that really you have probably like 30 to 60 days of inventory on hand. So you don't get charged long-term storage fees, um, which oftentimes means every couple weeks you need to log in, have a forecast, create new shipment plans and send product to, to anywhere from like four to five different Amazon FBA warehouses. So it's a little bit just different of a process than getting a PO from Amazon and sending them a bulk order. Um, we tend to take the approach of the brands we work with, we're kind of their Amazon outsourced team that does everything for them. And we engage usually in like a half hour or hourly weekly meeting and we kind of run the channel for them. The other approach that you can take is kind of hire a jack of all trades internally that runs all your Amazon stuff. So likely would be doing managing your content, buying your advertising, doing forecasting and ship plans and working with your supply chain to, to do that. And also like setting up your account and any new products that you're launching. So there's pros and cons to, to each. I'd say using a partner like us or others can be a benefit because um, you can always go hire somebody. I think the challenge when you hire somebody, if they're not the right fit or they do things wrong, um, you still have a pretty significant like head count with benefits and can set yourself back. Whereas with a partner, it's probably about the same as what the salary would be for somebody to do that work. Um, and you can always kind of bring it in house later on once you build the expertise and, and learn the channel. And then Sean, going off of that, um, what's your opinion about managing the brand as 1P and 3P at the same time? So more of a, like a hybrid model. Um, it can be done. It's technically in violation of Amazon's vendor central terms. So if, if, they, if you're on their radar and they actually care if you're large enough, they could shut you down on seller central and they close out your account essentially. Because the 1P terms basically say that you're not going to compete with Vendor Central and that you offer your entire product catalog to Vendor Central. Usually if you're like a couple million dollars or you're not that large, you're not on anybody's radar at Amazon that they're going to flag it or call you out on it. If you're larger, like we've talked to brands that wanted to do it that were doing 50 million in sales on Amazon, their vendor manager immediately realized it um, and shut them down and said, we're not allowing you to do a hybrid model. So there's it's not without risk, 
Um, but there are brands that, that do it um, and it can be done. Cool. Um, just a couple more, Sean, if you're good with that. Yep. Uh, I noticed that searching for one of our products, a bundle popped up with a completely different brand and item that we didn't create. Is that also a disadvantage of Vendor Central? I don't know if Amazon itself created that. Um, without the specific, without the specific knowledge or the the link of it, what I would probably say is, it's not Vendor Central most likely. It's probably somebody, one of your distributors who buys your product for another channel that created a an ASIN on Amazon that they sell unique to them, where they bundled it together and they're tr they're trying to win on that. So that kind of goes into like brand protection and understanding who's selling your products. There's a whole, like we work with brands to, to kind of clean up that landscape and put language in their dealer agreements that they can't do that. And then we monitor and kind of enforce those things for people. Um, but that's not uncommon. I've seen um, brands in like the CPG space, they sell to a distributor who like creates a three pack and creates their own standalone ASIN and just starts selling it and sometimes can do significant revenue. And the brand's not even aware that this ASIN exists or that somebody's kind of doing that when they shouldn't be. Um, but that is something very common. I would highly doubt that Amazon's bundling it together. Cool. Um, so sort of shifting gears, Sean, what tool do you recommend to manage IE inventory in Amazon's seller because we need to manage different sites in marketplace? Yeah, we use a, we use a handful of, of tools. Um, Celix is one that we, we use to manage that for advertising. We use, we use Kenshu. Um, there's, there's a lot of them out there. I think a lot of the big software as a service, Amazon providers are all starting to converge and be pretty comparable. And a lot of partners or agencies generally use those tools. Um, so yeah, depending on your need, I'd say Celix for kind of inventory and those type of things can be, be helpful. Cool. Um, and then last one real quick, going back to uh, kind of the advertising conversation, any way to determine lifetime value to justify lower ROAS? Yes, but it's not necessarily as straightforward as you think. There's some things in brand, Amazon brand analytics that will show like repeat purchasers, but it's not great or not perfect. One of the things that we do for our clients on seller, this is, can only be done on Seller Central, is kind of through the Amazon API, export all the, the order data. So first name, last name, ship to, and zip code. And we also will do that for brands like their Shopify website or big commerce website. And then you can start to like, we kind of do it through our backend database since we have all the, the order data, you can start to show how many people repeated, what's that repeat rate look like and start to get to like the one year, two year lifetime value. Amazon does not make it super easy today. Um, I think the other thing is also that's valuable is looking at it in the context if you have a D to C website, because people just don't shop in channels and silos. They likely maybe bought on your D to C website um, two times and then they realized the product was on Amazon, they switched over and then they made purchase four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 there. Um, and kind of vice versa. They may have come in through Amazon and then maybe you ran like a great special or like had a unique product on your website that wasn't on Amazon. They switched over there. Um, it's hard to like kind of look at it in the silo. So we try to do those things and it, it really comes down to like data feeds and being able to, to really uniquely identify the, the purchasers and match them. But currently today in the back end of Amazon, they don't make it super easy. Cool. All really good questions. And Sean, thanks for kind of doing the, the whole uh, I don't know, run robin thing and just kind of wheeling off answers. That was really helpful. Yeah, for sure. Great. Awesome. Well, we thank everybody for spending their time today. We will send out this deck as part of a follow-up um, shortly after this. So you should see an email from, from Sam or someone on my team that are reaching out with the deck um, that you can download and share with your team. We'll also post the recording to YouTube. So if you want to go back and review anything or share it with colleagues, feel free to do that as well. Great. Awesome. Thanks everyone. Thanks.